Hi class, welcome to Advantage. My name is Dr. Scott Adamson, and we're gonna explore a very important and very useful idea in calculus called the power rule. It's a nice little pattern-seeking shortcut for taking derivatives. We don't have to go through the limit definition every single time. So before we start with some symbolic justification for why this thing works the way it works, I'd like you to consider a graphical uh, approach to this whole idea. So let's start with Desmos, take a look, see if you can see some of those patterns emerge. So what we're gonna look at now is taking derivatives of polynomial functions. We're gonna start with a simple polynomial function, a linear function, and we'll build our way up. What I'd like you to observe and notice and look for is patterns. What patterns do you see? What things do you observe as we explore these different derivatives of polynomial functions? So in this case, we're gonna start with f of x equals 2x plus five, a nice linear function. Notice here in orange, we're gonna be graphing the derivative function, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So we might think like this. A derivative is a, a rate of change. A linear function has a constant rate of change. And in this case, the constant rate of change is just two. So we would expect that at any input value x, the output for the derivative or the rate of change function would be just two. So Desmos will do just that. It'll compute f of x plus h minus f of x all over h for some value of h. Notice I can make h as big or small as I like but we know that h needs to approach zero. So let me make h as small as I like. Now watch this. The graph of the derivative function as we change the input quantity is indeed the constant function just two. So as expected, Desmos is outputting a derivative function that is just the constant function two. Now what if we ramp this up? What if we go to a quadratic function? Let's go with x squared plus three. Now the function x squared plus three of course is this parabola and we might think about the derivative for different input values. Notice that for values of x that are negative, the rate at which this function changes is negative. That is if we change x by a little bit, the output quantity decreases by, in this case, quite a bit. So we would expect the derivative to start at some fairly large negative quantity. Now, as x increases towards zero, <clears throat> the rate at which this function changes is getting less negative, less negative, less negative, less negative, until we reach the vertex of the parabola where the derivative is zero. And then when x is positive, for input values that are positive, we have positive rates of change. And notice near the vertex, those rates of change are relatively small, and those rates of change just get bigger and bigger and bigger, as shown by this derivative graph. Now one thing you should observe is that this derivative function is linear. That is, if we start with a quadratic function, its derivative will produce a linear function and a very particular linear function. I'd like you to notice some of the values we will get out of this linear function. For instance, when x is one, when we input one into this derivative function, we output two. If we input two, the output is four. If we input three, the output is six. Do you see the pattern? The output on the derivative function is always two times the input. Let's see if that idea persists as we continue to build more complicated polynomial functions. Let's go to an x cubed. Let's go to a cubic polynomial. x cubed minus two, for example. Now this cubic polynomial for values of x that are negative has very steep negative, uh, positive slopes initially, very stark rates of change. That is, if you increase x a little bit, we increase the function output by quite a lot. Then as x continues to increase, those rates of change get less and less and less until right at zero, we see a rate of change of zero. Watch the derivative function develop just as we would have predicted. 
So for input values that are more negative, the output value on my derivative function is very positive. But getting less and less positive until the rate of change is 0 right at x equals 0. Then notice for input values of x that are positive, the rate of change is a little bit positive, more positive, more positive, more positive, and more positive. And so we see a derivative that is going to output positive values, and then more positive, more positive, more positive, and more positive. And I hope you would recognize that this derivative function resembles a quadratic, a parabola, but not just any quadratic. Notice when x is 1, when we input a 1 for x, we output a 3 for the derivative function. When we input a 2 for x, we output about a 12 for the derivative function. And if we input a 3 for x, the output is about 27 for the derivative function. Keep that in mind. And let's just do one more. I hope you're seeing a pattern here, but let's now go to a fourth degree polynomial, a quartic polynomial. Let's consider the polynomial x to the fourth plus 2. Now, consider what the derivative function would look like. We will have, for values of input values of x that are negative, we're going to see a pretty stark negative rate of change that gets less negative, less negative, less negative. And then right here around 0 again, we see rates of change that are 0. And then for input values of x that are positive, we're going to see positive rates of change that are relatively small. But those rates of change are positive, but getting more positive, more positive, more positive, and more positive. And let's see if that derivative function matches what we're thinking. Negative rates of change for negative input quantities for x. A zero rate of change when x is right at zero. And then positive rates of change for input values that are positive. And so yes, indeed, we see that derivative function that looks cubic. So to rewind, a linear function had a constant derivative. A quadratic function had a linear derivative. A cubic function had a quadratic derivative. A quartic function had a cubic derivative. There's something going on here. We're going to go explore this more formally and see if we can understand why this is happening. As you saw in Desmos, as we start to seek those patterns, you see that the derivative of a polynomial function produces a function that is one degree less than the function itself. The derivative of a quadratic was linear. The derivative of a cubic was quadratic. The derivative of a quartic was cubic. Now that pattern is true. We saw it happen, but why? Where does that come from? Well, we're going to find out by going back to the limit definition of derivative. Let's apply that definition of derivative to the polynomial function x to the n plus k and see why that happens the way it happens. So it begins with f of x plus h. That is, if we input x plus h into our function, we get x plus h to the n instead of x to the n plus k minus f of x. If we input x into the function, well, that's what the function is, is an input of x. It's the function itself, x to the n plus k. And then all of that gets divided by h. Now we're back to that familiar place. If you watch any of these other videos with derivatives and limits, we know that there's this thing that happens. If h is really nearby to 0, then this is really nearby to x to the n plus k minus x to the n plus k pretty close to zero, all divided by zero. We've got to do some more work to see how we can apply our limits. It starts with this. We have x to the, let me start with my limit. We have x to the h plus, uh, x plus h to the n plus k, but then we have minus this function itself. We have minus x to the n, and then if we distribute the minus sign, we have minus k. And so one of the things that we see is the constant k does not play a role in this derivative at all. In fact, in a, fun in a function x to the n plus k, the k just translates the function vertically, and translating a function vertically doesn't impact its rate of change, doesn't impact its slope or steepness. So yeah, as we see here, the plus k's are eliminated, and we're left with just x plus h to the n minus x to the n. 
But we still have this dilemma of if h is really close to zero, we're getting practically zero divided by practically zero. We still have some more work to do. And the additional work that we need to do, we have to remind you of something. If we have a binomial, this is a binomial, two terms, x plus h, a binomial raised to a power, there's a way that we can expand that binomial. Let's take a break here and, and look at how do we expand binomials. So, in a, maybe a college algebra class or a pre-calculus class, you may have explored binomial expansion, like x plus h to the first is just x plus h, or x plus h squared means x plus h times x plus h, which produces this multiplied out polynomial or this trinomial. x plus h cubed, x plus h multiplied three times, x plus h multiplied four times. Now, if you go look at your notes, you will see this, and I need you to just look through these lines and seek some patterns. And the pattern that I want you to see is this. As you expand binomials, the first term will always just be x to the n, x to the second, x to the third, x to the fourth. And then you're gonna have a whole bunch of other terms that are gonna have, notice, x cubed, and the next term is x squared, and the next term is just x, and then the, there's no x. So the powers of x decrease each time from x to the n, then one less, then two less, then three less, until there's no powers of x. On the other hand, h will start with, for instance here, there's no power of h, and then h to the one, to the first power, to the second power, to the third power, and then it ends with h to the nth power. So we see that h, h squared, h cubed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then one less, and then finally we end with h to the n. And you'll also notice that the coefficient on the second term, after that x to the n term, the coefficient will always match n as well. 2, 3, 4, and n. Now in between that, you're going to see different coefficients. 3, 3, 4, 6, 4, etc. There's some coefficients there, but as you're about to see, those coefficients won't really matter. Let's go back to our limit definition and see why I say that. So what we need to do is think about, in general, this binomial x plus h raised to an nth power. And as you saw in that binomial expansion, it would end up looking something like this. x plus h to the n. You're going to have first an x to the n. Then you're going to have the power, the exponent, times x to the one less power, one less uh, on that exponent. And then the h gets introduced. Then you're going to have some coefficient. and that is an interesting thing to study, but not here because you'll see that these middle terms are all going to be insignificant in just a moment. But you're going to have some coefficient, I called it C2, and then the x gets decreased by one more power, and h gets increased by a power. And that pattern continues. You're going to have another coefficient. You'll have one less power on x. You'll have one more power on, n, on, on h. And that just continues until we end up with just h to the nth power. Now remember that we still have to subtract x to the n, and we still have to divide all that by h. Now one thing you can observe in this next step, just to clean this up a little bit, look at the first term, look at the last term in our numerator. They're both x to the n. x to the n, but it's minus x to the n. They go away. So what we're left with is n x to the n minus 1. Then we have some coefficient x to the n minus 2 times h squared. We'll have some coefficient x to the n minus 3 h cubed. We'll have etc. until we end up with our h to the n. Now, this is where it gets really good. This is where the pattern recognition is really going to be helpful because notice that each of our terms, and I lost my h factor right there, notice that each of my terms have a factor of h. So we're going to factor out that h. Now if you factor out h from that first term, you'll be left with nx to the n minus 1. If you factor out an h from this term, you'll have that coefficient, whatever it might be, x to the n minus 2. But if you factor out an h, you'll just have h to the first. 
and then you'll have whatever coefficient, x to the n minus three, and then factor out an h, you'll still have an h squared. And that pattern would just continue, and if you factor out an h from h to the n, you'll just have a power one less. And all of that gets divided by h. Now, I know this might look like this isn't gonna be true, but we are on the final two steps here. Here's the last two things that happen h divided by h is 1. So what we're going to be left with is nx to the n minus 1. And then this term, c2x to the n minus 2 times h, has an h in it. This term has an h in it. Plus, this term would have an h in it. This term would have an h in it. This term would have an h in it. They'd all have an h in it until we ended up with plus h to the n minus 1. Now, as h gets closer and closer and closer to zero, whatever this was is going to get multiplied by practically zero, giving us practically zero. Whatever this was is going to get multiplied by practically zero, giving us practically zero. Everything in here is going to get multiplied by practically zero, giving us practically zero, including that. So all that's left from all of that is nx to the n minus 1. So yes, if you start with x to the n, the derivative is going to be a polynomial one degree less, and the coefficient on that polynomial is going to be the n that you started with. Now, what I'd like you to do is in the notes for this video are some examples about how all that happened, connected back to the graphs that we saw in Desmos. Take some time to confirm that, yes, indeed, the derivative functions have as a coefficient the power on the original function. And these derivative functions have a power, have a uh, exponent that's one degree less than the, what you started with. That is the power rule.